what will this mean for the British government's policy towards Israel-Palestine? Mm-hmm. David Cameron was somebody who, I think in his very first Prime Minister's questions, his second answer, he says, as a friend of Israel, and I consider myself a friend of Israel, he put into the House of Lords the, the head of the Conservative Friends of Israel. He was um, very supportive of Eric Pickles, who was very much campaigning on that side. A lot of the root of this is the movement for Catalan independence. The coalition he's now putting together, the number of parties involved in it is going to be in double figures. So it's a very, very, very unstable situation. But it does give some leverage, doesn't it, to the Catalan independence people, because if they hold... Welcome to The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And with me, Rory Stewart. And we're straight out of a, an amazing emergency pod. Did you enjoy your uh, live streaming? I did, although I don't know if you could tell, but my where I was recording it was in my office at home, and it's a complete mess at the moment. You were being rude about my hotel room, and I missed all this. Oh, really. good, 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 because it was it's a bit of a bit, chaos is the word. But interesting, was it? I did enjoy it. I really did enjoy it. Quite confusing seeing all these thousands of comments coming in and trying to keep up. And, and amazing. I mean, a real sort of an introduction to a certain kind of 24-hour news. So we were doing, for listeners who haven't caught up on our emergency podcast, we were covering uh, Rishi Sunak's uh, decision to fire Suella Bravman and bring in David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, through the House of Lords to become the new Foreign Secretary. And as you said, at the same time, there are these thousands of comments coming in on everything from... Uh, I'm not looking at the screen in the right way. I've got the wrong headphones on and various weird jokes going on. Yeah, but some serious points in there. Some serious points in there. And some interestingly, I mean, quite a, a mixed audience. So there were people clearly from the left who reckon Suella Bravman has no support at all. People mm-hmm. clearly from the right who reckon Suella Bravman speaks for 70% of the country. Which she doesn't. Which she doesn't. Um, but a really, I, I mean, I thought it was it was good to get that debate happening yeah. in oh, yeah. life yeah. In, in, in real time. Yeah, no, we should definitely we should definitely do it again. So we're going to talk about the continuing fallout from Rishi Sunak's reshuffle. We're going to talk about uh, whether Suella Braverman has a political future. We're going to talk about the marches, not just here in the UK, but also a fascinating march in in Paris at the weekend. Uh, essentially showing support for Jews and against anti-Semitism. And we're also going to have a touch, uh, talk about Spain and Portugal, some very, very interesting developments in both countries. Um, and uh, But I, it was it was interesting today. I just came out of the tube and I was walked into uh, the newsagent and, and all the papers were laid out there. Every single... This, it's very rare that this happened. It happens every single national newspaper had the same, basically the same picture on the front, which was a huge picture of David Cameron. And I think only the Daily Express had a tiny little headshot of Suella Braverman. And the headline was something like, you know, who's going to speak up for the red wall now? As if Suella Braverman was some sort of great campaigner for places like Burnley and Accrington. But, but that, of course, is what her pitch was, wasn't it? And, yeah, and the but reason... I think it's nonsense. Yeah. So to just, just again, quick, quick, quick reminder for people. So Suella Braverman has been uh, positioned herself as the voice of the right of the party. And it seemed to be important for Rishi Sunak when he was running against Boris Johnson, basically. So Liz Truss, you remember, fell after less than 50 days in office. And there was a rumor that Boris Johnson was going to try to come back as prime minister. And the whole question was who was going to be able to cross the threshold of 100 votes. So Suella Bravman was signed up to come in behind Rishi Sunak and was meant to be critical to stopping Boris Johnson's momentum and letting Rishi Sunak get through because she's supposed to speak for um, a right-wing element in the party represented by figures that many people won't have heard of, like John Hayes, who's a sort of veteran right-wing conservative backbencher. Tim Bale, who's um, an academic who we often quote on the show, has done some analysis on it. That's because he sends lots of messages. He does send And lots some of them are very good. They're very good. <laughs> anyway, he points out that actually he's done the numbers and he's decided that Rishi Sunak didn't need Suella Brahman and that she brought over far fewer votes than people mm. would have expected. It looks like she only brought over about seven votes. And, and that's one of the problems. Somebody presents themselves as being the leader of a faction of the party. But when they swap sides... They can't actually bring their followers with them. I, Boris Johnson experienced this when I was running against him in the leadership. I remember he convinced Matt Hancock to join him, promised Matt Hancock the chance to be health secretary. Matt Hancock promised to bring over all the people that had voted for him in the previous round. 
But actually, in reality, those voters almost entirely went to me and to other candidates. They yeah. didn't go over to Boris Johnson. Um, so I think the same problem with Sola Bravan. So anyway, on this basis, this legend which has been built up, which she was an important voice for dozens of MPs, he kept her in the cabinet despite repeated tension, tension over her language around invasion of immigrants, tension around her saying living in homeless people living in tents was a lifestyle choice. And then most recently, the thing that really blew it up was that she wrote a column for The Times in which she described uh, the pro-Palestinian marches as hate marches and said the police were playing favourites yeah. and Downing Street had not cleared this. Anyway, over to you. I mean, I... I... Look, we, when Johnson, when there was this stuff about Johnson coming back, I thought it was utterly ridiculous. I thought it, it was, even for the Conservative Party, impossible and a complete nonsense. It was never going to happen. And I think we said on the podcast at the time, I was not of the view that, Sun, that Sunak needed to do what he did with the Bradman. He lost to trust. And then when he didn't have a, a challenge... I think had Johnson managed to get the numbers, which he wasn't going to do, they're not all crazy, then he would have beaten him. Um, and I think it shows a lack of political judgment on his part that he felt he had to do that deal. But he, he must have been desperate. I mean, as you often remind people, he came into politics in 2015. Mm. He was running very, very uh, you know, early in his political career. He'd just lost a leadership race less than two months earlier. So he must have been not wanting to take any risk. Yeah, yes. yeah. That point about experience is incredibly important. In fact, just outside before we came into the studio, the other podcaster who's performing today in this building is Ian Wright, the former Burnley but, footballer. I was very pleased because you said to me very embarrassingly in front of him, Colin Rory, who is this guy? And fortunately, I did actually recognise <laughs> Ian Wright. <laughs> you did. And he then said that, you know, we were, what was his word? We were rocking it. No, smashing it or rocking it or something. Anyway, he was making the point. We were talking about Burnley. And because uh, he did play for us for a while, and Burnley, as you may know, Rory, were currently bottom of the league. And he was talking about the importance of experience. And then we got into the thing about Cameron. And he was making the point. He said, Look, say what you like, and everybody's saying all sorts of things about him, but at least he's got a bit of experience. And, I, you know, I think that is, that is a significant thing, you know, to have somebody now. I've been, I've been thinking about it a lot overnight. I think there are massive risks in it. But I think on balance, it's a, it's a pretty good move for them. The risks are, are obvious. You know, he's the architect of austerity. He gave us the stupid referendum, which has ripped the country apart. His money making. I think there will be a problem. And interestingly, I watched an interview with Rhys Mogg last night, Jacob Rhys Mogg. And this is their line. It was very... And, and, and so Rhys Mogg representing the Tory right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And first of all... And, his and first, not, not a fan of Cameron. Not all. a fan of Cameron. And his first point was, it's a terrible mistake. He's bought this nonsense that Suella Braverman sort of speaks for the working man. You know, Suella is this and Suella is that. But then he went on to say, I know how you think David Cameron, very, very, very impressive prime minister, did some marvellous things. I think the risk for Mr Sunak will be that David Cameron will rather overshadow him, that people will look at him and think he's much more prime ministerial. And I think that's, so that's the line they're going to right. run. And that is a risk. There was a picture. Downing Street released a picture of Cameron and Sunak together in the cabinet room. And it was a little bit like that Elon Musk picture. Right. Cameron sort of looked yeah. very kind of... Well, he's, he's tall. Physically. He's tall. Yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah, quite yeah. sort of well built and he's he looks prime ministerial. And Sunak there in his sort of white shirt. And... But on the other hand, I suppose it's... You, you could spin it around if you wanted to spin it and say it's a sign of confidence yeah. from Sunak that he's prepared to have Absolutely. his predecessor work from. Um, and as you say, the experience point's really important. I mean, David Cameron basically entered conservative politics in 1989. He really served his time. He was... a Special advisor, famously during uh, to Norman Lamont during the ERM crash, he I think first started getting on the candidates list in the mid nineties. Um, tried to run in ninety seven, got in in two thousand one, became party leader in two thousand five. I mean, he's really no, he's been around, it. and and he knows. I guess I mean he'll be a bit rusty, I suppose, after six seven years. But what, what do you make of him as a media? What's his strengths and weaknesses as a media performer? Oh, I think he's I think he's a very effective media performer. Um, and, and, and you saw that yesterday, actually. He he was um, being interviewed in the Foreign Office and the interviewer trying to run him ragged on Greensill, this financial scandal. 
in which he was involved and and he he just he shut it down quite effectively now i think there will be what's his line to shut it down Has his line to shut it down was that was then this is now i now have only one interest in one job and it's the foreign secretary and he's you know he just he he dealt with it pretty effectively um i think he's also got a you know he's he's got a calm about him which i think is incredibly important in politics tony blair always had that tony was always even if he was raging underneath or he was sort of boiling with anxiety he had a calm about his public demeanor which johnson never had trust never had and i think soon that sometimes and, looks and more... gordon, gordon brown never had no gordon you always felt yeah. the kind of the the, yeah. the the tensions in there but but cameron does, <clears throat> does have a calm about him i think you i think there'll be a problem i think some of your former cabinet colleagues will be looking at him a, a bit askance I'd love to know what's going through Michael Gove's head. If you think Michael Gove, who, you know, basically destroyed him uh, as prime minister in a way. I mean, he and Johnson between them effectively destroyed Cameron. So there's Gove, who would Gove have thought he might have been up for one of these jobs? I bet he did, you know. Oh, yes, would have really hoped. I mean, Michael Gove has been dreaming of being foreign secretary for, for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, he's never had one of the top no, four jobs, has and, he? And he's... And he's barely left the cabinet since 2010. Mm. I mean, he's one of these real veterans. I mean, there are a couple of them. Uh, Jeremy Hunt left during Boris Johnson's period, but has also been in yeah. a lot since 2010. It's very hard, though, now. Let's be frank. There's Rishi Sunak at the party conference, basically. And by the way, sources close to David Cameron have told me in the past that Cameron was very pissed off with Sunak's speech at the conference because he was he said, he wasn't saying... Labour were a failure. He was saying we've had 30 years of failure. Um, <laughs> well, and, well and, and I think people pissed off in the same way that many people uh, amongst your friends were very angry with Ed Miliband's attempts to repudiate Tony Blair. They, they People don't like the idea that you're yeah. trying to represent change by shitting on your predecessor. Exactly. So he, yeah, yeah. But that was his big message at the party conference. I am the change. And now he basically... You know, if you think if you think about the various stages of Sunak, he comes in at the start and says, I'm going to be competent compared to the others. That has sort of now got lost in oh, all he cares about is spreadsheets. Then he was going to be the change. And yet his answer to change within a few weeks of that speech is to bring back the guy who he was pissing all over in his yeah, yeah. conference speech. And so it's so just, just a lack of strategy. And who attacked him over HS2. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think Cameron that... will be Cameron will be a team player, though. I think that one of my favourite quotes about politics, Harry, Harry Truman, saying it's amazing what a small group can can achieve, provided nobody cares who gets the credit. I think Cameron, he didn't look like somebody yesterday who wants people to think he's more powerful than Sunak. Well, the, I think he's and, a team player. And the great advantage is he doesn't want to be prime minister. Every other member of Rishi Sunet's cabinet wants to be the next conservative <laughs> leader. This is the one person who's been there and done that and doesn't want it again. Yeah, but you know what? Do you, do you think, yeah, possibly. He might think if it crashes and burns and renounce the peerage, get a seat last minute. Oh, that would be interesting. It depends what he's felt actually over the last six, seven years of his life. I mean, I think as, a, as an ex-politician myself, I mean, there are definitely moments where you really do feel incredible nostalgia and lack because there's a sense of purpose in government that is very difficult to get in yeah. private life. So I, to some extent, it's a wonderful gift for Cameron. I mean, it's a chance for him to reestablish himself as a statesman in a way that, you know, Tony Blair and John Major managed to do, but he really hasn't managed to do, partly because of Greensill, partly because of Brexit. So I think it is a, a great gift for him. Mm. It's interesting, within, like, minutes, sorry... <laughs> Actually, it's very annoying to get a, a text um, during the thing, but this one's worth getting. I'm not going to say the author of this, but it's almost as if he was listening. Why is everyone, this is, you'll see from a senior Labour figure, why is everyone being so nice to Cameron? Holding the Brexit referendum was the worst single decision by any prime minister in British history. In the words of my physio this morning, he's destroyed the country. Why doesn't he crawl back under a rock? <laughs> so that he's, is a different he's, view. He's, so he's not, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by this question because I'm, I've am i not traditionally really been a fan of his. I, Cameron was not my style of politics. Mm. Um, I actually, to, to help my career, I actually wrote an article in the New York Times in 2008 saying I thought Gordon Brown would be a more serious prime minister than David well, Cameron, which really, right. really kind of helped me. Um, <laughs> but I've been fascinated by the way in which somehow even if you look at his individual mistakes, which are very, very many, 
I mean, it's quite difficult. And huge. I mean, the referendum is yeah. a well, catastrophic. I had, my friend John Hatt so, came up with a list of 257 mistakes that David Cameron made, which he'd be happy to, happy to share with who, you. Who's this? This is my friend John from Cumbria, but he used to write down every catastrophic Oh, well, let, can, we have, yeah. the, can exactly. we have it for the newsletter, get, please? Get him on. Get him on. Um, but, and, and I, you know, really felt that he, my, my problems with David Cameron, I think, probably began with, his refusal to come out against the Iraq war, his refusal to actually come out boldly on Afghanistan. But I also thought the style of the way in which he ran things mm. was not profoundly serious. I felt that he was, um, you know, he was, he was loved because he was very calm. He was loved because he chaired meetings very efficiently. People um, said, you know, compared to Gordon Brown, who would get really into the details of things and spend, you know, hours agonizing like some great spider brooding over the system. David Cameron was very efficient. You know, meetings were run on time. My sense of it was that's not my style mm. of person. And yet civil servants often liked him because he made decisions quickly and easily and he didn't get too anxious about things. Journalists always responded more positively to him than I could ever quite understand. So there's something I don't quite get about him. I think it's 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 the same with um, George W. Bush. I could never really get him. I could never really understand why people say said he was somebody they want to have a barbecue with. I don't want to have mm. a barbecue with him. Um, what's no, I, I get that completely. Um, I, think, I think the answer to my friend's question, why are people being so nice to David Cameron, is also partly because he is now the person who's not the guy in charge and some people will be building him up to use him against that including on the right and on the left so labor um will and i do think with i was speaking to somebody pretty high up in the labor party yesterday and i was saying that i think actually you should use this to signal to the rest of the labor party this is an opportunity to up the game you know this is an opportunity to remind people the tories are going to do anything they can anything to try to hang on. And I think that, you know, Labour should take this on as, a, as an opportunity. And, because and what is the opportunity? How would you characterise it and, 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 and use this? I think the opportunity is actually about the, 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 the fact to the point of, of Sunak not really knowing what he's about and what he wants to do for the country and he doesn't have any clarity about his plans. And it doesn't really, it doesn't change the fundamentals for people's lives. So it becomes, and if you think, if you think about it, our conversation is reflecting this. It's really about how this is playing politically, how people within politics are feeling about this. But it's not going to change the fundamentals for most people's lives. And that's where I think Labour can play in, Cameron. This, the story of the reason why the Tories have to go is not just because Sunak's not up to it, not just because Johnson was a liar, not just because Trust was awful, but we've had five prime ministers now, starting with Cameron, who gave his austerity in the referendum, Theresa May, who you know, yeah. couldn't hold yeah. the party together. Yeah. Johnson, who's an exposed charlatan liar, Truss, who smashed the economy, and now Sunak, who doesn't know what he's doing. So I'd build the five in as part of the narrative. Build the five in. Um, before we move on, I think two things interesting about this, if we take the position seriously. One of them is that the advantage of being a foreign secretary in the Lords is that you can travel much more. Um, you don't have a constituency. You're not bound in to voting in the House of Commons the same way. That was something I felt. So I was the Minister of State in the Foreign Office in the sort of number two position. And it was absolutely unbelievable how often really important trips had to be cancelled. Yeah, because you had to vote. For me to come back and vote or get up to the constituency and how much trouble I got my constituents who would say, you know, why were you not in the constituency this weekend? And I was saying, well, I had to go to the inauguration in Kenya or whatever. Mm. So I think... To, for, to, be, to be moved out for a Chinese to be moved out, junior exactly, for a junior diplomat from China. Exactly. That was, that was my experience. So I think um, it will be good to have a foreign secretary who's actually able to be abroad. The other thing that we're really going to have to concentrate on is what will this mean for the British government's policy towards Israel-Palestine? Mm. David Cameron was somebody who often in the House of Commons, in fact, I think in his very first Prime Minister's questions, his second answer, he says, as a friend of Israel, and I consider myself a friend of Israel, he um, uh, put into the House of Lords the, the head of the Conservative Friends of Israel. He was um, very supportive of Eric Pickles, who was very much campaigning on that side. And he was very, very much against the Muslim Brotherhood, which is um, allied to Hamas. He's tended, and, and of course we heard 
when we interviewed uh, on on leading, um, the accusation that he'd become too close to uh, Michael Gove and to a particular... Oh, with people, Saida. With Saida Wasi, that she was suggesting that one of the things that disappointed her about David Cameron is that he tended Go to... Go radicalised yeah, him, to, she said. Yeah, yeah, to buy into negative stories about Muslims and um, connections between Islam and terrorism. So I think from Israel's point of view, they will feel that they have got an ally here and we'll have to see how Cameron negotiates that. And of course, Europe. I mean, he, mm. he is somebody... I mean, he, you know, he's the foreign secretary. He's somebody who makes no secret of the fact that he thought that... Um, Brexit was a catastrophe. Am I right in saying that he flirted with you with the second referendum idea? Um, I mean, I think there was there were, there were, we were in two minds about whether actually having having Cameron out there on the cause was a good thing or a bad thing. Not not for any. Um, I I think on balance, it, you know, he'd he'd moved away. I think he wanted to stay out of the debate. Um, but there's no doubt, and I think also he was one of those Tories who thought that, well. You know the referendum's happened, and we're going to have to try and make the best of it. I, I, so I, I think flirt is probably about as close as it ever got. Um, I, th I think the other thing about his, you know, once he gets into doing the job. So I thought it was very interesting yesterday. Within five minutes of leaving Number Ten, he was he was having a meeting with the uh, Indian Foreign Minister, and then he was doing a phone call with Blinken. Um, and he's, you know, there are some pretty big issues there. And it's there's no doubt that he will get more traction being Cameron going around the world. There'll be, there'll be more of an interest in him than there would be had he decided, to, as Sunak appointed, I don't know, Michael Gove. Or... No, it's a really big deal. And, of course, remember that many of the leaders who are still in place were in place when he was the Prime Minister. I do lots of, I mean, I saw, you know, I mean, Mark Rutter, he's, he's leaving, but Mark Rutter, the Dutch Prime Minister, tweeting, welcome back, David. Carl Bildt, yep. former so, Prime Minister. He, he's one of the few who's been a Prime Minister and a Foreign Minister and saying, you know, join the club. And and Modi was, uh, Narendra Modi was um, leading India when uh, Cameron was Prime Minister. Xi Jinping was leading China when Cameron was Prime Minister. Vladimir Putin. Um, uh, Joe Biden was the Vice President of the United States mm. when, when he was Prime Minister. So, and of course, in the Gulf, most of those monarchies, uh, he will have had a very oh, yes. long-standing relationship. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing we should talk about, given that former prime minister... He was, he was at the King of Jordan's son's wedding, you know, so yeah. he's... Yeah, and that was a few months ago. He's plugged in. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talk. There's, uh, the Israeli press have been running this story about Tony becoming Netanyahu's hum sort of you know advisor on how to get out of is, it. Is that true? Well, I think it's true that the Israelis would like Tony to to be involved in some way. But I think Tony's view is that only if it's a really serious proposal. Um, and, I don't and, think he'd and, want it, to it be... It's the right way to approach it, to be working for the Israelis as opposed to be independent of both. Well, I think that, that would... No, I think that's what, what it would be. It would be a bit like the role he had before. As, uh, but um, but it's, as it were, the idea is coming from them because I think they understand that he does have access and traction on both sides. I think he'll only do it if... Uh, he he thinks this is a genuine, serious attempt by the Israelis to get this thing to a better place, um, and I think he needs probably a bit of convincing about that. Very good. One, my final point on the reshuffle, something which I did think was quite interesting. I think we've discussed this before. Politics is about the only arena in life where the you never see people going down a few pegs. So there's me talking to Ian Wright. You regularly get managers who've been in the Premier League, then they pop up in the Division Two, yep. and you get players who start at Arsenal but they yep. end up at yep. you know Watford or. Yep. And but that's partly about getting older, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah, but it's also about the fact of in politics, if you're out, you're out. Whereas, I, so I thought it was interesting that Andrea Leadsom yep. and Damien Hines, yep. both former cabinet yep. ministers, he's brought them back yep. in positions. A couple of levels down, which which I think is I think is a good thing. Well, it's, it also says a lot for people like Damien Hines, who's who's been the prisons minister, having been the Edu secretary of state for education when in, in Theresa May's cabinet with me, and a really good cabinet performer, that he has been prepared to just keep pushing on now for a long, long time mm. as a junior minister, having been a cabinet minister. It says says a lot lot for him. So Rory, here we are talking about Cameron being a serious figure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Sunak getting the party and the Conservative Party in a better place, but then he goes and ruins it all by what? I mean, what? I heard the new chairman Richard Holden 
majority 1144, just to give him a few sleepless nights. I heard him this morning trying to answer the question, what is the Minister for Common Sense and what is this estimate very person going to do? And he didn't seem to me to have an answer. I mean, what a complete nonsense. The, Minister for Common yeah, that, that, Sense. That's pretty peculiar. And I, I do think, although we in Britain pride ourselves on common sense, and although the Conservative Party loves to see itself as part of common sense, I think defining common sense has defied most but of the, great, the greatest analytical sense. philosophers. I mean, they had a minister for levelling up. That yeah. didn't work. They, no, but, no, but, but, what does le, it mean? Le, levelling up, at least, I think you get oh, there. Yeah. Common sense, I think, is very difficult to get your head around, partly because everybody thinks they have common sense yeah. and almost none of us do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it also does say, I suspect, the other thing that will be a problem, Cameron will give a problem, is that there'll be a lot of MPs thinking... This is basically a judgment on us that he felt he had to go to the House of Lords or put somebody in the House of Lords to get a foreign secretary. Yeah, yeah, I think there'll be people cross for that. Right now, just just to finish the first half, um, France. Mm. So there's been these extraordinary march in Paris, very very moving march, over a hundred thousand people marching against anti-Semitism, and it was a rather wonderful march. I was talking to someone who was on it. Uh, the decision was. There were no banners, no slogans, no chanting. So people walked in a very respectful way, but there was applause as people walked through. Um, it is a complicated issue in France, to put it mildly. Mm. Um, Third biggest Jewish population in the world. Very large, kind of half a million people. And even though there's been an increasing emigration from France to Israel over the last 10, 20 years, still a very significant, significant population. France, of course, a very complicated, deeper history of anti-Semitism. So it's a slightly different context to Britain, a Dreyfus affair, but also, of course, the Second World War. Um, and I think though now, anti-Semitism in France is largely at least perceived as being driven by Muslim communities. And one of the um, tensions in French society is between quite a large Jewish community and an increasingly large mm. Uh, Muslim, mostly North African community. The incidents of what the police and the security services define as anti-Semitic acts has tripled since October the 7th, um, 1,250. And, you know, we said last week that the some of the Jewish people that we've been speaking to who have noticed that this is their, their what Braverman calls the hate marches, which was one of the most offensive things to say, but... What, what what they feel is that when they see these pro-Palestinian marches, you see people of all classes, all colours, all ages, etc. But when you have pro-Jewish marches, you tend only to see Jews. And what was different about the one in France was that this was did have much more of a feel of people coming out and saying, look, there is this rise of anti-Semitism, but we are not going to be part of it. And it was much more of a classless kind of exhibition. And of course, the big news story out of it was the fact that Marine Le Pen, uh, leader of the far right, whose father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, was an avowed anti-Semite, that she was on the march, but Mélenchon, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who leads the, the hard the left... Sort of, the sort of Jeremy Corbyn Jeremy figure. Jeremy Corbyn type yeah, figure in yeah. French politics, was not there. Yeah. Presumably either because they're worried about offending his Muslim supporters or because he's part of that hard left tradition that does have a little bit of a yeah, problem yeah, with Israel. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, like Corbyn himself. I guess the Corbyn analogy is a, a good one, isn't it? Um, one more thing that was very interesting is there's been the daubing of Stars of David on walls in France. And it appears from the early reporting as though the people doing it were Moldovans who appear to have been in contact with some kind of Russian handler. And this has raised the possibility that quite a lot of what is happening, or some element of what is happening, is the Russian intelligence services trying to stir up oh, strife sure. in Europe. And, and they have real, I mean, this isn't just a conspiracy theory. There's now very good documentary evidence that they did exactly that in Germany in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and very, very successfully. So deliberately backed German far-right groups to do anti-Semitic things really shook the German government, got the British Parliament and others very angry with Germany, caused huge rifts in Europe. And certainly Russian bots have really been pushing hard this kind of divisiveness. Mm, mm. God, the world without social media, do you think it might have been better? Just possibly. <laughs>
Hey. Shall we have a final word before the break on the 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 the, the future of the weekly marches here in the UK? We are talking about pretty big numbers now. The police normally give underestimates of these numbers, and even the police were saying 300,000 yeah. at the weekend, plus our marches yeah. in different parts of the country. I wonder whether, and, and I do think that some of the the Braverman, I thought Sunak's statements on the week of the policing was, a, was an outrage, actually, because it, it was a little bit like Trump's, there are good people on both sides. They were trying to equate, they were, they were essentially saying that these far-right protesters or they called them counter protesters, but who were trying to get to the cenotaph, that the violence was sort of equivalent to what was happening on the on the pro Palestine match, which just was not the case. I mean, if you just look at the numbers of the far right and the level of violence, it was horrible. And then you look at three hundred thousand with just a few arrests. It was there was quite a good balanced article I thought in the Times by somebody who'd been with the um, the pro Palestinian uh, march. Uh, which we can share in the in the notes, um, in which he got the sense that a lot of it was very moderate, very friendly. And I, I saw bits of it. I took mm. my kids out um, to Hyde Park that afternoon and I saw a lot of people coming back with flags. And um, But there were also things that he... Oh, yeah, no, I mean, for sure. And, and, and definitely the there's something visually very, very disturbing about people deliberately dressing in balaclavas oh, yeah. with Islamist yeah, yeah, yeah. headbands because that's a real kind of sort of ISIS weirdness. Going no, and, I, and, I, and I think, again, to be fair to the police, the police get a lot of flack. Uh, they were put under horrible pressure by what Braverman and the right-wing press did. And I I thought it was quite interesting how they they police things as fairly calmly, apart from where it got really violent. But then on the, mon on the Monday, I think it was, the Sunday or the Monday, I think it was after the armistice um, commemorations, they put out a series of pictures, quite a lot of them, essentially saying we'd like to interview these people on, on bo both the far right yeah. and some people on the on the pro-Palestinian yeah. march. And I suspect that very quietly now they'll be going around interviewing these people and saying, you know, why did you carry that anti-Semitic placard? Why did you uh, offend that person at Waterloo Station? Uh, whatever it might be. So I think it, I, I think that I think they handled it pretty well under pretty intolerable pressure. Good. Well, take a break. Take a break. Do you want to have a legacy? Do you want, when you die? Do you want people to say, "Ah, Rory Stewart, he left us this and he left yeah, us that"? that. I, I would really like that. Would I just you? need to work out what it is. Yeah, yeah. What it's, 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 when, well, maybe I think you, when, maybe you need to take up Fiona's suggestion, go and work for the king, or convince Keir Starmer that he really needs a foreign secretary with sort of deep international experiences. Oh, Keir. Keir, are you listening? I think, David, more to the point, David Labby, are you listening? <laughs> that could be a problem. <laughs> anyway, this uh, podcast legacy, it's a collaboration between Goalhanger, which makes our podcast, and Wondery, another leading podcast producer. And all you need to do to listen to it is search Legacy wherever you get your podcasts and you can binge entire seasons of Legacy ad-free on Amazon Music. So, Rory, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Let's start with Spain. I mean, it's it is amazing what's happening there, and yet I know there's a lot going on. There's the Middle East, there's the Sunak reshuffle, etc. But you've really got to dig into the British media to find anything of what's happening there, and it's kind of cataclysmic what's going on. Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, a little summary: um, a lot of the root of this is the movement for Catalan independence, which maybe we can talk about a little bit because there's some interesting parallels with. Scottish independence referendum, Brexit referendum. Um, and what happened after that Catalan independence referendum and now an amnesty that's been declared. But give us give us your sense on the current politics and then maybe we can go back a little bit into the history of Catalonia. Well, so you had an election where essentially nobody really won and to put a, uh, a government together, Pedro Sanchez, as uh, prime minister, has, has done a deal. Uh, with a series of Republic Catalan independence movements and parties, and the deal, part of the deal is that there'll be an amnesty for people who, in the eyes of the courts, broke the law to set up uh, an independence referendum and broke the law sufficiently for the leader, Carles Puigdemont. He had to sort of flee the country and go off in exile. So you've got a lot of people who've who've now basically who were seen as lawbreakers 
and are now going to be given an amnesty as part of this deal. And the and there's it's led to massive and, protests. And this is in one Spain. of the classic questions, isn't it, in democratic politics, trying to form a coalition, whether you are prepared to bring in parties who are outside the pale in order to shore up your coalition. Mm. Big question in Israel. Of course, big question again and again with far-right parties in Europe. You know, Germans trying to work out whether you bring the AFD and things into yeah. coalitions, which yeah. they wouldn't want to do. But certainly from the point of view of traditional Spanish I suppose moderate nationalists who really believe in the rule of law and the constitution and holding Spain together, they are completely horrified. And something like two thirds of the Spanish public is totally horrified yeah. that in order to push himself into power, Pedro Sanchez, who is this sort of relatively good looking left wing leader, has decided. Two, two weeks in a row, row, you've talked about how good well, looking the, the, he is. The, the, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I was also praising the Argentinian. I mean, I think this is. This oh, sorry, is, that's right. Yeah, that's right, the Argentinian. Generally, yeah. generally, my theory yeah. that. that um, good looking leaders. That Latin politics likes good looking leaders. <laughs> um, although you then told me that actually this, this wasn't true, this is universal, and that basically good looking people win elections, and that they did research in the US, and that was true there. It wasn't just about good looking, it was about looking like they're winners. Looking like You don't winners. always have to be good looking for that. But the thing is that I think the other thing that's driving. The anger is they've had an election where actually the the vote for the independence parties really fell. Yeah. So it, it went down from forty two percent in twenty nineteen to twenty seven percent in 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 Catalonia. So you've got you've you've got lack of political legitimacy is how the rest of Spain is looking at this. Or, and, or you and, know, and, big and chunks. And Sanchez of also didn't win. Uh, the right wing party got slightly more votes than him, so he's yeah. also. It would be like Gordon Brown in Britain losing the twenty ten election, or getting fewer votes than Cameron, and then pitching together a deal with the Lib Dems in order to to stand power. Um, just quickly back. I on. don't think you can. I mean, can, hold on, Roy. Yep. Let me just pick you up on that one. Mm. You can't quite compare the Liberal Democrats. To no, 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 no. no. We cert certainly couldn't can do that. No, 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 of course, so. no, those fine, <laughs> proud, moderate nationalists and the Lib Dems cannot be compared. Of course, they get in a lot of trouble if I did that. Um, um, so, Catalonia, really interesting. I mean, I think a huge difference between Britain and Spain on this issue. So, to remind people, um, Catalonia, like Scotland, had a very interesting, distinct history from the rest of Spain, different institutional history. It was originally an independent territory, then became part of the Spanish monarchy. But even after it became part of the Spanish monarchy, had very different legal and parliamentary systems, and of course had a different linguistic heritage, different language, mm. much more so than in Scotland. I mean, very, yeah. very distinct language, um, difficult for Spanish speakers to understand. And it then became the industrial powerhouse of Spain. So obviously the central Catalonia is Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about this amazing footballing heritage and all this kind of stuff. Um, and of course- um, Mar Maradona played for them, you know. Maradona, play your friend Maradona, yeah, your teammate. Um, they also had, um, a, you know, this was very important, of course, during the Spanish Civil War. And the question of whether parts of Spain break away and become independent is even rawer because not just the Catalan movement, but also Basque terrorism and the movements there. So that it maybe feels to, it's difficult to get an analogy, but maybe a moderate Spanish nationalist feels more about it in the way that people would have thought about Ireland in Britain in the 19th century, more than perhaps people thought to think about Scotland mm. today. Anyway, uh, Puigdemont was elected into the regional government uh, in Catalonia, and he decided in 2017 to hold a referendum. Now, unlike Scotland, where basically Cameron said, fine, you want to hold a referendum, you can hold a referendum, and if you get more than 50% of the vote, you can go independent. Spain has very strong constitutional structures to prevent Was that one that. of your friend's 257 mistakes? Yes, I would have said that was one of those mistakes, yeah. yeah. And I actually think the whole idea, I think the Spanish are right and we're wrong. I don't think major constitutional changes should be able to happen just because one politician wants them. Every other country, Spain, the United States, etc., these big constitutional changes would require a supermajority, not just a slim 50 plus one vote. And that's what got us in trouble with Brexit. And that's what would have got us in trouble in Scotland too. Anyway, in this case, um, he pushed ahead. It was boycotted by uh, anti-independence voters. It was declared illegal by the Spanish government. The Guard of the Sevilla was, de was and deployed. And the courts. Deployed, and the courts. So you end up with the Spanish police 
you know, well over, you know, 15,000 of them deployed into Catalonia to try to prevent these elections happening. It's almost impossible to imagine mm. the British context is happening. Mm. People then turn out to vote. 92% of those who voted vote for independence on a 43% turnout. It's quite high. Yeah. So to put it in context, if you do the maths, in Scotland, it was 44.7% on an 84% turnout. In Brexit, it was 51.9% on a 72% turnout. And the maths works out like this. 37.47% of the British population voted yes, of eligible voters. 37.82% of the Scottish population voted yes. And in the case of Catalonia, 3956 So more, Even on that low turnout. Yeah, more people as a percentage of the registered voters voted for Catalan... Even with a massive boycott. ...voted for Catalan independence than mm. voted for Scottish independence or for Brexit. However, it was completely disallowed. And Puigdemont then... Uh, fled. Fled, went into exile. An arrest warrant was issued for him. He had to skip around different European countries, was eventually picked up, I think, by the German police... And he's being chased for lots of things, including misuse of public funds because he had to pay for the ballot boxes, which are normally funded by the federal government. And for the majority, it seems, two thirds of Spanish people, this is not something they take casually at all. They mm. see it as an existential threat to the existence of Spain. Mm. And they mm. cannot believe that Sanchez has um, freedom. In fact, it appears... So there's a strong argument that what Pedro Sanchez has done is actually illegal. Mm. He doesn't have the power to grant an amnesty. The king can pardon someone like the president in the United States, but but Pedro Sanchez can't. Mm. And in fact, the, apparently Europe, the European Union is now demanding an explanation on what yeah. he's done. Of course, this is all to avoid him having to... He could just have said, well, the election result was unclear. Let's have another go. Um, and the, the coalition he's now putting together... The number of parties involved in it is going to be in double figures. So it's a very, very, very unstable situation. But, but it does give some leverage, doesn't yeah. it, to the Catalan independence people? Oh, because if huge. they hold the balance of power, they Absolutely. can then push they, for another referendum. And, and, and also, I, look, I think it's, it's, it's very hard to see how he holds it together. There is an argument that it's taking, the, taking what is such a clearly political issue out of the legal uh, framework and back into the political framework, there is an argument. Yeah, which I think, um, and certainly in a British context, I think we would probably see it in that way. If Nicola Sturgeon had decided to push ahead holding a referendum which wasn't approved by Westminster, I think it's unlikely that she would have been pursued through the courts, prosecuted for illegal use of money, and had to flee the country. <laughs> yeah, she has other legal difficulties to, other, other legal difficulties <clears throat> to contend with right now. But the, the and the, these protests are getting you know pretty pretty violent. The the um, the former right wing leader uh, Quadras he was shot in the face uh, on a street in Madrid whilst out on a protest. And while we're recording this, he's still in he's still in hospital. And there's, there's also, and of course, that's the sort of incident that gets all sorts of kind of conspiracy theories going. So, the assumption at the start was that it was a sort of left winger, but now there's a, the, the, there's the, the serious suggestion that actually it was a it was a an Iranian uh, hit job. Um, so this is yet another what feels like quite a local issue where there may be kind of quite international international factors at play as well. It's extraordinary, I and mean, what the Iranian government thinks they're doing, trying to. I mean, that, that seems unlikely to me that they would think... Not necessarily a government, but, you know, there could be all sorts of other yeah. tensions going yeah. on. Because don't forget, a lot of, you know, tensions play out from that part of the world, in, as we're seeing, you know, we're seeing in the UK right now as well. So anything else you want to say about Spain? No. Or should we move on I, to... I think, yeah, should you we cross to, the border bring into us on, Portugal? Bring us on to Portugal. So this is Antonio Costa, who again uh, is a bit of a sort of hero for the moderate progressive left. He was a man who was seen as um, so the, the leader of Portugal. Um, Socialist Party. Socialist Party. Um, this is his second term. He was seen as doing well with COVID. He had sort of relatively gentle measures to come out of austerity, seemed to be getting economic growth off the ground. Very, very uh, interesting backstory. As I think you pointed out to us when we were celebrating the fact that Rishi Sunak um, was the first British Asian Prime Minister. I think you pointed out that actually this in Europe, he was actually the third because um, uh, 
we have a, a, a prime minister of or a Taoiseach of um, Asian descent in Ireland. And in the case of Antonio Costa, his father, Orlando de Costa, is part Goan, part mm -hmm. Goan Indian, and, and partly from Mozambique. Mm. Um, anyway, over to you on this, on what's well, happening. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's a, you know, and I think when he was running for his last election, I did a big profile of him in the New European. Uh, and you, did you go to interview him and stuff? No, I didn't interview him, but yeah. I, 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 went, I, went, I went out there and right. sort of met people around him. Oh, well, what, did you, what, did you, what did you learn? Well, I, I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote a very, very positive piece, essentially saying this guy is bucking the trend. He's a left of centre leader at a time Europe seems to be shifting right, who's competent, who's popular, and who is taking Portugal in an interesting and different direction and doing it very, very well. And our old friend Corruption comes along. Now, he is pleading his innocence, um, but the fact is that a lot of cash was found in his, uh, in his offices uh, and in his official residence, and his chief of staff, a guy called Vitor Escario, has been arrested along with five others. And the reason that they've been singled out is that the, the, the authorities say they were worried about them fleeing. Uh, Costa is also be subject of a, a, a criminal investigation. Um, and this relates to some pretty major uh, projects, building and hydrogen projects in different parts of Portugal. And it was a big, big, big investigation. Um, and he he didn't technically, in a way, have to resign. But I suspect they have quite an interesting relationship between the president and the prime minister. The president was pretty clear that he was going to call a new election. And so Costa's stepped down. He's the caretaker prime minister until an election. And we're waiting to see who's going to represent which parties at that. And Portugal's a very positive story, really, within the European Union. It, at, in some sense, it, it's reminiscent of Ireland. It was a country that was very poor after the Second World War. In the case, obviously, of Portugal, part of a dictatorship until the 1970s, Salazar, joined the European Union in the 1980s and changed very, very quickly from a very poor place to a place that began to get into the middle of the league tables mm. on life expectancy, GDP per capita, developed quite a good tourism industry. And it's also had, as, as we've discussed, managed to avoid a lot of the problems of far-right populism, uh, although I was called up on that with somebody pointing out that there is the emergence of a far-right populist party mm. in Portugal. Who, who, who will benefit from this, I suspect? But they didn't do nearly as well as people expected at the last election. Yeah. They were the big the fear, and it just didn't happen in the way it had elsewhere. So I think I think Costa has held off, that off. But, you know, corruption, when, when you think that populism, part of it is about turning the people against an elite, there's nothing worse than corruption, corruption for and, that. And, and unfortunately, Portugal has had a bit of a bad reputation as corruption. I'm, I'm fascinated by corruption because... <laughs> We talk about it a lot in British politics, but the scale in Portugal has been much more dramatic. Socrates, who was the successor, Antonio Guterres, who's now the UN Secretary General, was the Prime Minister of Portugal. And his successor from the same party, mm. the same Socialist Party, Socrates, got caught up in a big corruption investigation in which he managed to get a dodgy university to award him a fake engineering degree in which he ended up with millions of euros being held by a mate for him, so he he was in real trouble. Well, and, and and even though Costa, this this is the first time that he's been right at the heart of one of these corruption scandals. There've been ten senior government officials who've lost their job since he won in 2022. Yeah, so, so one of the ones I touched is I I knew slightly the lady who was the chief executive of, of Portuguese Airlines. Mm -hmm. Oh, tap! That was tap. a big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she had to step down as part of one of these scandals in which. Uh, the Treasury Secretary of State received a 500,000 euro severance payment when she stepped down from the border tap. So quite a lot of these scandals are these are companies which are sort of partly nationalized and politicians and senior civil servants get on positions in these companies and end up getting payoffs. So it's, mm. it's and, and then, as you say, um, the Secret Intelligence Service of Portugal then recovered a laptop Somebody called Galamba then came in as the new minister and then was also accused of conspiracy and this whole thing. So it, it is, it's a bit, it's a bit it's messy. A bit murky. 
it's a bit messy. And and there there's investigations, as you say, about hydro, about a data center, about, about lithium, lithium, lithium mm. exploration. Mm. Uh, so unfortunately, just as final thing on on um, Antonio Costa, his father, Orlando de Costa, if people want to read about him, was a Goan writer. Goa was, of course, historically part of the Portuguese empire, as was Mozambique. And strangely, actually, Antonio Costa's cousin is a senior politician in Mozambique as well. Um, he was imprisoned. And his mother, she's called Maria Antonia Pala, who's also a very big figure. So the Prime Minister's mother, big figure in her own name, is a fantastic, radical feminist journalist um, who campaigned to make abortion not a crime in Portugal when it was a very mm -hmm. traditional Catholic country. Married his dad because uh, Antonio Costa's dad was in prison, and you, you, because it was a conservative Catholic country, you couldn't have conjugal visiting rights unless you were married. So when he was re vaguely, briefly released from prison, she married him before he went back into prison, so that she could continue her conjugal visits. And so he comes from this very kind of interesting radical left wing. There's an uh, opera background. in there, and there's an opera to be written about. That's a good, that's a good, good I mean, opera. I'm one of my, even though I'm not really into opera, but one of my <laughs> uh, yet as yet unfulfilled ambitions is to write an opera. Well, I don't think it sounds like a very good idea if you're not into it. I think you should be doing things that you love, shouldn't you? Yeah, because then I could be, I could get into it by why not writing. A, why not a musical? Or do you like not them like them? I love than musicals. Operas? I love oh, you musicals. should do a musical. Then. No, but I think operas are just sort of sound a bit grander. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, just just to just to maybe close on this, the the public prosecutor's officer office. This this just shows how things could go horribly wrong. They confuse the name of Costa with the economy minister, who's called Antonio Costa Silva, when they were transcribing all the wiretaps. So there are lots of wiretaps involved. This is going to be a great scene of the opera. There were all these wiretaps that were transcribed. And so according to the lawyer of one of the defendants, the there was this terrible error where so Costa's Prime Minister Costa was being confused at one stage with the economy minister in the in the wiretap. But, 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 but if you think about it also, I mean that the, could be a good defense. But, but also if you think about it in the context of British politics, if the security services started wiretapping the Prime Minister, you'd have to be pretty confident what you were doing oh my God, before yeah. you got a secret. And also, well I don't know what the system is in Portugal, but certainly here, I don't know what would happen because here sort of really intrusive surveillance that the Home Secretary has, has to, to sign, sign it off. Yeah. So that'd be good. If, if, if James Cleverley's first, <laughs> first sign-off was to say, we have reason to believe we need to wiretap the Prime Minister. Yeah. 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 So there we are. And next week, I think we should have a little discussion, whilst we're in Europe, we should have a little discussion about Holland, because, the, the, sorry, I keep saying Holland. Holland is part of the Netherlands, the Netherlands, because they've got an election coming up, um, which is going to be very interesting, I think. Very good. We'll look forward to that very much. Thank you. So we've we've done a lot. Portugal, Spain, but on the Middle East. Oh, and Donald Tusk has now finally got his coalition together. Which is great news in Poland. And just to remind listeners that that is the election of a really impressive moderate force and the breaking of the back of the populist stranglehold, which has been in, in Polish politics since 2015. So really remarkable victory. Okay, Rory, enough for now. See you soon. Great. Bye-bye. <laughs>